Hello, everyone, and welcome to this last intervention of the inspirational talks at the Smart Board Challenge 2020. I'm very glad that uh, we have Thomas Maya with us in the studio today, who will give us a bit of insight on the community building and the open innovation. He is a senior lecturer at the University of Geneva, but besides that, he is also the president of an association called Open Geneva, which runs open source hackathons, and they call it Open Geneva Festival. So I'm really glad to have you here on board, uh, Thomas. And um, without further ado, I just hand over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, Ines and Adelaide, for organizing the webinar. We um, really appreciate to be here. Um, I've uh, followed some of the, the pitch from the last uh, Smartport uh, uh, hackathon session in uh, in November it was really inspiring. I really hope you're going to make it in the uh, great for this uh, this new new hackathon that I understand you're you're getting towards the end. So that's always a very exciting moment. So I want to tell you a bit more about the importance of uh, of community building uh, for for your projects. Go beyond your group and uh, try to build further. And especially now, being at the end of the hackathon, you might. I hope I can inspire you to. Uh, to 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 leverage uh, uh, building community for the future of your project, whether you win or not, the the hackathon doesn't really matter here. So I'm going to share a few slides. The goal is to to is is to to inspire you, give you also a bit of my background, and and tell you where I come from, and uh, and then we can have a discussion. I really hope you will have a lot of questions, and uh, please feel free to to ask whenever you whenever you want. Uh, I'm just. Just let me go through this very little technical thing, which is, uh, you know, uh, about uh, starting the slides. So, and uh, yes, now I should be in sharing mode and then you should see my slides. So I, I hope it's okay. Um, if not, I don't know, actually you can, have, or I can get some feedback if it's, oh, okay, so it's perfect. So I'm, um, as Ines said, I'm a faculty member at the Geneva School of Economics and Management at the University of Geneva. And I have two domains of research. One is uh, cyber security risks, which we don't care about today. And uh, the other one is collective intelligence and open innovation. So I've been researching on how to organize communities to make them um, work together in, um, in, a, in a most efficient way and in an open source and open innovation way. Um, open innovation really is taken at, the, uh, at a broad sense. The goal is really to, to focus on how humans interact socially uh, in the physical world or online in order to, to make the, 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 the innovation happen. First thing I want to say is that uh, my passion for hackathon started at SwissNex San Francisco, which is the Swiss technology and education embassy of Switzerland in, um, in San Francisco in the US. There are several Swiss next San Francisco all over the world. And we were asked uh, by a, a professor at ETH Zurich to organize a conference on, uh, on uh, earthquake resilience. And uh, at some point we said, it's too boring to do, to do conferences. We are going to do a hackathon inside instead. And we organized this hackathon in, in one month and it was a big success. We were the first one to really think of organizing a hackathon in a, uh, on on earthquake uh, in in the Bay Area, so it was sort of like a Swiss bringing a new methodology or using a methodology of uh, for innovation in the Silicon Valley on a topic that is really uh, core to and of tip of core importance for the Silicon Valley, and this has this is quite important because uh, actually when you when you want to organize a hackathon, you have to to make sure that uh, this. Uh, this um, your topic is actually going to be appealing to to people who then want to join. So, very uh, we didn't organize any prize or whatsoever. We just said come and gather uh, in at Swiss Next, and then it was uh, we got eighty people just uh, come spontaneously. And actually, we didn't announce prizes, but then in the end during the day we said yeah there will be some prizes, and then people got even more excited about about hacking. So in one day some very nice uh, application was were developed and that was really a reckoning moment uh, also for me as a researcher that uh, we we can certainly do things much faster than in a project management mode the way we are so then i started to try to as a researcher to rationalize that and as i'm a researcher i must show you at least one graph and one of the 
the really important result uh, we found, it was uh, uh, about the same time, was analyzing uh, open innovation uh, communities. So for instance, uh, here the community of people working on uh, on Apache web server, which is one of the main uh, uh, web servers in the in the in the world, the main web server uh, software, and what we found uh, in a nutshell was a, a quantitative uh, um, uh, uh, verification of uh, the adage by uh, by um, Aristotle: the world is more than the sum of its parts. So what we found basically is that the more people were active, the more people were active in this community in a time being of one, five days, which means around a week, the even more people were producing. And that's what you see on the graph on the on the left. The, the green line is the number of active people uh, over time. And then the red lines, are, the red spikes are actually the contributions that are made to the code. So of Apache. So what it shows is that actually the, the more you the more people are there at some point uh, to contribute, the even more contribution will be. And this is quite quite nice. There are, I don't want to go more, more into the, the science of that, but the idea is that actually there's some um, there's some emulation in the and uh, of production uh, when when people get together. And this is uh, very important. So so think about if you are two in your in your team and then you get to be six and then you go to another scale, you get to be suddenly 20 or, or 100 in your team. This is going to be producing a lot of uh, a lot of, of production provided that you that you can uh, innovation provided that you can organize. So that's a, an issue we can discuss. So what I want to say is uh, where well, there's something actually fundamental in having people do things together. We know that the the brain uh, of human brain as um, is uh, is one of the most uh, uh, is the the organ of uh, of our body that is actually really bringing us humans a uh, uh, competitive advantage in nature. So we are not the fastest runners in the world. We get uh, there are, there are, there are leopards for that. Uh, we are or gepard. We have uh, we are not the, the most killed uh, people with uh, with our hands. We are not the we are, we are not those who see best in the jungle. We are we are not just we are just sub suboptimal animals. But what we know how to do is actually to do things together, and this is where we are getting our our advantage. This has been called the social brain hypothesis by uh, Robin Dunbar at University of uh, Oxford, I think, or Cambridge, and this is a very popular theory of why our brain is to is so big. It's actually to handle social interactions. So at some point we should try to leverage that the best and community is the way to do that. Then the second thing is that when you get to want to be in innovation, what you want is to actually bring interfaces. So you want to you want to make sure that in your community, you're going to get people from different mindsets so, and culture and expertise. And that's a, quite a difficult thing because uh, very often we want to be, you know, stay on our own and, and do stuff the way we are used to, we are used to but actually where innovation comes from is from actually going into some kind of, a, I would say gentle conflict of uh, people who have uh, different backgrounds actually bring their knowledge and uh, nicely integrate it with the knowledge of others. And so there's a there's a, always when you do collective intelligence or community building, there will be some conflicts, but normally a uh, good community is a, a community that can resolve this conflict to actually make sure that people who have different opinions they can they can work together and do stuff that is going to bring something the world is more than the sum of its parts and something that is quite original and this is this is quite uh, we know it works uh, with some difficulties but it works quite well and actually the very fact that you are participating in a hackathon is to prove that it, it works but it's still quite not well known and well understood in um, in science so this is what what is uh, uh, now uh, really keeping me busy in doing research is to really better understand why and how people get together to actually achieve more than some of the parts uh, uh, Ines was talking about uh, um, a festival. I'm going to get to it, but uh, I think before that, I want to talk about what we what we believe is uh, something that uh, some ingredients that can really make people be inspired about and uh, motivated about uh, about um, uh, about getting and doing things together. First, there's this idea that you have to experiment. If people just do stuff together, they they build things together, they 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 tinker until they they get to get things uh, w uh, working 
that's great. So it means that if you build your community, you always have to present these people in your community to be part of a, of a tinkering experiment where they can have, a, I go to my second point, they can have fun. So fun is mobilizing intrinsic motivation. This is something that comes directly from our guts and uh, makes us just move for move forward and helping in some for some causes because we really like it. And uh, uh, when people like things, they ne not, not necessarily need what we call extrinsic motivation, which is getting money or getting a, a tangible reward. And then we believe that for a community to work, we should have a sense of share, uh, um, um, so, sorry, a sense of sharing. That people should be proud of what they do. They should be happy to share, and they should be, um, and they should be willing to receive some kind of uh, uh, feedback from the from the um, from those people who are actually uh, listening to them. So uh, then, on the receiving end, I think it's important that uh, in a community you get people to be inspired and to be happy to be to be part of the adventure. And this, I would say, are these four ingredients that we believe are very important for community building. And then I will get to the serious thing a bit later. Also, there's something that I discovered from one, one hackathon that uh, I'm very, very proud of. I'm not organizing. It's called Hacker Health. And it's actually a bunch of uh, engineers who are actually getting around people who are heavily handicapped, disabled, like this uh, little Emma that you can see in the, in the, in the picture. And... Uh, and, um, and all around you see Campus Biotech and EPFL and other engineers and designers to help her to solve one of her uh, problems associated with her um, uh, handicap. And I think this is really important to be compassionate, to really think about who is the person I'm going to serve best when I'm doing, when I'm doing some innovation in a community. And this is, uh, this, this is one specific ingredient that we never thought of, but we discovered with this hackathon, Hacker Health. And being compassionate is something very important. Actually, we discovered it, but it's been well known uh, from a Stanford Design School. Uh, you know, these guys who invent, invented design thinking, Actually, this is not much taught, for instance, in Geneva, but you go, when you really stick to what they, they teach at the Stanford Design School, compassionate innovator, innovation is the most important part of their, their curriculum. So actually, when you want to innovate on something, you always have to find the people who are actually embodying the use case, the, 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 the problem you're going to, to help them solve and understand what they have in mind. So... Uh, so these principles, uh, with this addition of compassionate innovation, we've been we studied that in uh, in 2017. It's a, a festival that Ines talked about, which is called Open Geneva, and it's a, uh, occurring every year. Uh, just not last year because it was just right at the outbreak of, uh, of of COVID, and we could not adapt fast enough. But it's an open innovation festival for science, technology, and society. And you can see in the logo the uh, 17 colors. And uh, I would let you guess that the the 17 colors are. I won't let you guess actually that it's the 17 colors of the SDGs of the sustainable development goals. So even though we are not really pro putting a, a, a clear stance on, on sustainable development, those who know these colors, they, they can see in our logo that we are strictly committed to the SDGs. And uh, the festival in itself is about having around 30 hackathons, uh, a grassroots and also um, from grassroots people so people will just say i want to organize a hackathon and they're gathering 15 people but they're also major institutions like the university hospital of geneva campus biotech uh, we had a hackathon at cern on mobility and so on and so forth and so in 19 2019 we had 1200 participants so um uh, so i mean we can count participants and, and be proud of that of course but i think the the underlying idea behind that is that we want to actually have a community of people who, uh, who uh, across the border, the, the boundaries of institutions in Geneva, they can talk to each other and exchange. So our wish is actually that a physicist from a, from CERN would just be happy to go uh, and hang out with uh, with uh, I don't know a, 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 phys a physician at a university hospital, um, and together they would actually hang out with a software developer from the University of Geneva or from EPFL, and actually they would just work together in a way that it would not be tr uh, trivial. And so far we've done not a bad job actually, uh, connecting people from different institutions. But the way we did that is not to go and talk to the directors of these institutions, but actually to gather grassroots 
momentum, having people just being happy to participate in hackathons and doing that for their own for their own personal benefit, maybe just because they like it, or maybe because they see that it's going to be something positive for them. I already am at my last slide, and I think it's a bit of a scary uh, last last slide here, but I want to tell you a very nice story that I read in the, in the, the New Yorker. Uh, it was an article by uh, by Jonathan Franzen, a um, famous American author. And this guy in this in this article, he says, wait, the title is, uh, what if we stopped pretending and the climate apocalypse is coming to prepare for it? We need to admit that we can't prevent it. So of course the guy is bold and he's saying, well, actually, you know, this target of uh, maintaining uh, uh, or the Earth's planet be below the, um, the, the two degree limit of, uh, of, uh, of, of climate warming is already overshoot, overshot. We should, just, uh, we should just acknowledge that it's going to be very unlikely we can make it. And um, he says, well, you know, we should just stop pretending about that and we should get prepared for the worst. And uh, I, I won't spoil all the, the story, but I'll make a little spoiler. Uh, um, uh, Jonathan Franzen lives in the, in the, um, in, in Santa Cruz, uh, California. And um, he says, well, maybe the solution to a problem is actually to build communities. And he's, he gives this very nice example of a woman. It's very much hippie Santa Cruz style, but a woman who has a big garden and she's welcoming homeless people to, to, uh, to use her garden to do a little uh, a vegetable uh, um, uh, a potager uh, where they can actually they can actually plant carrots and, and own and and uh, and take care of a little a little a little part of uh, of of the, the garden to actually grow some 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 fruits or some some uh, some vegetables and he says well this is maybe the thing that actually with all these people we are going to migrate and we are going to move around uh, before be, because of the climate crisis we should actually think of building communities that are going to take e care of each other beyond boundaries of uh, usual boundaries of being you know on our own or little uh, um, a close community, but just be ready to welcome new people who are going to come from from wherever. And I really like this story. I really encourage you to read this uh, this story. It's not maybe practical for your for your for your your challenge or your your project, but I think it's. Uh, a, uh, I was asked to, to to deliver an inspiring talk, and uh, so I'm trying to do my best in inspiring you. So this is one one thing. So I'm uh, as this is my slide. So I'm going just to stop sc screen sharing, and I'm going to continue a bit more. Um, uh, let me just stop screen sharing. Um, uh, I'm going just to tell a bit, a few more practical things. Uh, what we actually learned from our experience that community is the most important thing. When I was it was in the Silicon Valley, it was really the start of this big tech bubble that we know we see it actually now probably stagnating and probably uh, decreasing. And it was really crazy. Everyone wanted to have a startup. And one student from UC Berkeley, where I was a, a postdoctoral student, uh, fellow, he, he told me, look, you know, I'm starting my company. And I say, well, this is just great. You are 23 years old, you, you start to say, and I said, but what is, how are you going to succeed? And he told me something that really kept it in my mind until now, and that's why I'm ripping it to, to you. He said, oh, but I, my, I have my first follower. I have my first person who is interested in my, in my, to, to, by my, by my idea, by my project. And, uh, and these people want to help in a way or another. And help, I said, but what do you mean? This person wants to buy your product, or wants to buy your innovation? He said, no, I, I don't know yet, but this person is committed to help in a way or another. And I know that once I have this person who is committed and wants to help, this person is going to talk to two or three other people who, want, who, who then, or uh, maybe more, and maybe two or three other people are going to join, and then, and so on and so forth. And the guy said, well, once you have your first follower, you're, you're really on track to actually make your, your project a success. And for me, it was really mind blowing. This idea that actually you need you need only one person, maybe just to start a sort of a giant uh, viral uh, uh, a viral marketing or viral uh, um, um, awareness building of your project. And uh, and then um, of course this is one story, but I have another one which has actually has been de uh, developed by. Uh, um, and documented in a in a paper in a, in management science uh, in a management journal science, which is called uh, Academy of Management Discovery, and it's about uh, the documenting hyperloop uh, uh, 
um, Hyperloop Corporation. Um, and this is one of these companies that are uh, uh, working on uh, developing Hyperloop from, uh, from uh, um, uh, Elon Musk. And um, this company has something very special. They have barely one or two, I think two or three employees. And the rest of the people, they're actually working for free. They get no money, but actually get they, what they get is uh, they commit to work uh, some amount of time every year, but they don't get any any salary. What they get is to get uh, stock options. So they work only for stock options on part time in the weekend or some or, or or in the night or besides their their job. And actually, they they commit to do some some work to help Hyperloop this company Hyperloop to transportation LLC to to uh, to to grow. And then finally, by having this open source uh, community approach, they could suddenly actually get some people who are passionate about this idea of having a uh, having vacuum uh, uh, train. Uh, uh, development people in India, they say, well, I wish to have that in my city or in my region. I'm going to, and I have some go good connections with the government. I'm going to spend some time trying to convince this government to actually uh, implement this technology. And the role, the role company is only, is no more than two or three or five, uh, five employees. Maybe by now it does a, a bit more, but, but the idea is that actually people will just work for, for free or on the, on the prospect that actually in the future they might get some rewards out of it. And I think that's a good lesson for the, the world we live in. We live in a world of uh, two things. I think that are really in core ingredients for, 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 for um, our life is resources and knowledge resources are, and artifacts are uh, abundant. They're all over the web or on the internet. You can just go and find resources for making your project a greater project. So the problem is actually to get this project, this this knowledge integrated in proper proper way, in a way that you're going to deliver something original and meaningful, and that's probably the hardest thing. And for this, what what is the best way to actually search the knowledge space the fastest? Well, you can use Google, but Google everyone gets to the you can get can do that, and actually there's no competitive advantage. The next competitive advantage is using social networks. And you see where I'm heading to. So once you are starting mobilizing your social network for helping you on your project, actually you get to start to build a community. But these people, they are really powerful. You know, there's uh, something called the six degree separation, which actually is no longer six degrees because social networks have changed that. But the idea is that very traditionally before the internet and before social, social networks, it would just take six people between you and the president of the United States. So you would have just to hope six times to actually get in touch directly with the, the president of the United States. By now we know that with social networks, this uh, number has, uh, has reduced to, to a bit, something between three and four. So it means that to reach anyone on earth, you need to only hope three times uh, on your social network. Of course, this three times is not easy. If you want to to contact an Inuit in a, in a, in North Canada, you might have more hardest time to than to connect uh, to someone in the United States or in Morocco. Or for sure, some some people are hardest to reach. But think about if you can really mobilize this community for you for on you for you for you for helping on your project. You might just you might just uh, uh, converge much quicker in the in the in the, in the in finding an original and meaningful and and bold solution and i would want to to add two more things that are very important is that first thing is that this community at the same time that they come up to help you they are going to also help you bootstrap your use case so if you are uh, clever enough to actually ask these people what they think and and uh, of your of your product and your idea your innovation and and you are ready to receive and to be open-minded listening to what these people think and what and also accept criticism and bootstrap upon this criticism and this uh, this advice you can see that very quickly you can converge towards a, a better use case for for these people who in the end when they see that actually their contribution is taken in, into account they're actually going to be even more uh, willing to to help you further so that's the first thing and the second thing is that now when, when we, we want to develop solutions in this world, I think uh, a, a decent startup should have, a, should have a, a global or at least a, a continental reach. I mean, Switzerland is a very good example of an 8 million, it's an 8 million inhabitant country. It's for many ambitious projects, this is way, way too small. If you want to actually make your project 
fly and be and be profitable you probably have to especially when it's a technology you have to immediately think beyond uh, the the the, the uh, si uh, market of 8 million you have to reach for U european union or maybe asia or maybe uh, north uh, africa and uh, north america south america and maybe all of them and then i think the community can help you also make sure that your innovation is going to be sustainable and also integrated with uh, with what better integrated what with what people need across continents across or across countries or across cities and that's very important i want to 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 finish my talk on this idea that actually the more you you involve people uh, through a community the more you're going to make sure that your innovation is going to be socially acceptable and this is something that is very important i uh, i want to finish on that with, but with a very concrete example switzerland very strong we are very strong in cryptography and and security and when COVID started how the outbreak started the, the swiss institute of technology in lausanne epfl they came up with an idea of actually having a, a privacy preserving uh, way of uh, sharing when people were like to build a COVID app for tracing but that would be privacy preserving and the 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 the, the app is a is a technological marvel there's no way actually you can really see uh, and, and for the state, the government to actually see who has been in contact with whom and so on and so forth. Just amazing technology. Well, bottom line, how many people really uh, uh, download this app? One million over eight million. So what does what is the lesson of this? That they built a marvel of technology, but actually people were not really to uh, socially accept the, the technology. They would not understand it. And so what they missed probably is maybe organizing a, a big hackathon or big moment of uh, community building to actually make sure that the te technology would be socially ac acceptable. Instead, what they asked is actually they asked the army to uh, to test the technology. No one trusts the army. The army is there just to to help when there's a uh, there's a trouble. But no one has a, uh, I mean, I guess nobody has a lot of faith in in the army to help for a civil uh, for a civil problem. So that's I want to finish on this lesson that make a, uh, technology socially acceptable is quite ma making sure that actually this technology is going to be also good for the world. So I want to finish on that. I'm very happy to take questions if there are. So I don't know if, or I can see questions if there are. Um, um, ah, okay. Here I am back again. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Thomas. This was really an inspirational and inspiring talk. and many, many facts uh, new to, to us. Uh, some of them are sort of integrated in the hackathon that we are currently talking about. And I'm just going to, to ask you, starting some questions, uh, to give the audience some time um, also to think about questions. So you mentioned uh, the four pillars of having experiment, having fun, leading them to share, and getting ex inspired. So what you see this in combination is rather co-opetition. So a mixture between collaboration and competition, or would you see it's rather the collaboration, uh, collaborative aspect um, more integrated in, in the four pillars? Yes, I mean, competition is a very special uh, concept that we, we are, that has been quite well documented. Um, um, there's always something that you that you are competing against or you want to, you know, gentle competition. So I would say collaboration is the most important thing. But what we what we see is that actually, yeah, people, you, we can remove almost uh, totally the competition side of, uh, of a hackathon and make it work very well. What we, we uh, started uh, doing some empirical studies of what's going on in a hackathon and it was last, last November. So we are just now looking at the results. But what we found is that actually our students uh, at the University of Geneva who participated at the, at the, the OLAS hackathon, what they, what they were really thrilled of was not really competing with other teams. They were, of course, we didn't frame them this way. So you can organize a hackathon to make it uh, competitive, but we didn't do that. And what they were thrilled of is actually was the deadline. The only thing they were they they found was really exciting was that they, they would have limited the amount of time to do something that would be that would be great and for greater good. So we we also found that uh, people they want to go to hackathons because they want to do something that they they know they could not achieve alone. So it's an it's important for hackathon organizer to to think of projects that go beyond what 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 
one person could could solve by by yourself and uh, and uh, and in this framework there was no there was no competition only collaboration but just there was this this competition for the deadline in a way so which was more uh, more uh, internal so uh, I would say inner to everyone but so I mean for sure of, of, of course I think I guess if you have like several projects and challenges and teams that are working head to head in the in a hackathon people are they necessarily want to they 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 they, they want there's something quite human of trying to beat uh, even if it's very nice the, the other team or just do better and that's uh, i think that's the competition side we, we we love we think it's very important but you know you can just you 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 don't need to actually make the hackathon a competition to actually make it competitive so that's maybe the message mess message i wanted to share this is interesting because you also mentioned that um you had to run hackathons where you did not have a prize pool in the beginning, but it just came later in the game, which was an additional motivator, uh, motivational factor, but was not uh, the one to start with. So you had basically no prizes in the beginning, um, but you still mobilized a lot of people to join uh, this. And I think this is also um, due to the cause that you're working on. Um, and if it's close to the heart of the participants and if they really want to change something in this um, environment. Um, but you also mentioned that um, your hackathon, uh, you are thinking now, and, and you put it in one of the slides that uh, will run from the uh, 18th to the 28th of March, um, will be fully virtual um, due to the current uh, sanitary um, crisis. Um, what do you see is the most difficult part for the community building and the collaboration when you're fully virtual instead of being in the room with the participants? Uh, here, I'm going to be bold. We we see only advantages of being uh, online. Um, it's uh, for for hackathon organizing uh, organizer is way way less logistics, and um, and actually we we found that there's no much difference in terms of experience. I mean, of course. I mean, given the circumstances, let's say, let's say now we are over with COVID, and we say, and everyone can gather again, and we say, uh, oh yes, no, we're going to continue online because it's just an amazing experience. Not sure it's going to work, but given the the the, the situation at the moment, we the all the feedback we got is that actually um, we managed, and we don't know really well how we did that, but uh, we had some previous experience. We worked also with others like um, uh, Impact Hub uh, Switzerland. On this versus virus hackathon, we we managed quite well and repeatedly to actually bring out bring a really nice uh, cozy environment even online. Just make people be uh, uh, be part of a uh, feel part of a community even online. And I think people, all people who participated, they say it's uh, it's it's a very nice moment. And one thing that we do is what we call cross pitch. So twice during the hackathon, we actually spend one hour uh, where every team can talk to all the others and uh, we can take questions and so on and it's a bounding moment that's a moment we just do we people say i've done that uh, each team they say i've done that but these are still the problems i'm facing and so on if you want to if you want to help give a hand pass by my my slack channel or, or come to my zoom session or whatever and i think that's something that is uh, that that was quite uh, changing uh, game changing and we also had some activities but so um um and the other, so it works quite well, and the engagement is good. the The logistic costs are much lower, and also what we we found is that actually we can just quickly go international. So that's a very, very important uh, thing for us. But it also carries some some challenges because we have a mandate in our in our association to serve Geneva first. And uh, and then when we get some participants from Germany, uh, Singapore, China. Um, a, um, uh, Colombia. I mean, what does it? What is the the value added for 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 Geneva? This is uh, sometimes that's kind of a, an open question. But uh, but but uh, technically, we we don't see really much downside given circumstances. The circumstances at the moment, uh, any downside to online uh, to online hackathons. The results are quite the same as good. And yeah, so I don't know if it answers your question. It does pretty well because also this was my next question. How would you see the future of hackathons? We have 
had a lot of face-to-face uh, -face hackathons in the past. Now we are almost a year uh, bound at home and we have participated, as you mentioned, to many already um, online formats like uh, in Switzerland, the Versus Virus Hackathon to find uh, solutions against the crisis. Um, how would you see the future? As you say, once we are allowed to go back uh, to face to face uh, and meet again um, in person, would you think the hybrid part uh, could be something interesting to look into also to um, engage the not local community and bring international experience and uh, yeah, you mentioned the skills of the community. So maybe bringing skills to the table that you are currently maybe not have in your local community. Could this be an option to, to be half virtual or connect people virtually to a physical hackathon, maybe? So Open Geneva is this, yes, of course. I mean, it's going to be hybrid in a way or another. That's my, my view, but we don't know well how to do that. And there are still problems. I mean, when you have everyone online, it's, it's easy in a way because you create one environment. If you have everyone in a physical space, you create one environment. But we know from the, the classes we get in our, in our master program at the University of Geneva, that being hybrid is quite complicated because people who are in the room, they feel it's, uh, they, they, I mean, they get they get a lot of weak signal uh, that is additional to what people experience where they are online. And I think many students they were who are stuck online because they cannot travel to Switzerland. Uh, they 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 in, on the long run maybe it's okay for hackathon, but on the long run it's uh, something that is really they feel it's unfair. So they don't get the same signal. They they will miss part of the experience, and that's really the problem we have to solve. But then you can think of a hackathon that uh, with the, some teams that are online and some that are offline, and then they are competing in a way or another. It's just important to continue managing the the team the teams online, um, and maybe have one person who is actually in charge of uh, dealing with the the people who are online. I don't believe much of having people at the same time. Let's say you have a group of six and you have three people on the on site and three people online. I mean unless they know each other and they used to work together already. Otherwise, I, I feel it would, it would be hard. But so, <clears throat> you know, Open Geneva has this special thing that we are, we are, we are, we are humble enough to, to know that we, someone in our community is going to figure out this problem in a way or another. So because we have so many people in our community who are organizing hackathon, we trust that some people in our community are going to come up with, uh, everyone is going to try and someone is going to come up with the, the nice way of uh, dealing this problem. So we are quite confident. We are trusting and trusting our community that they are going to help us solve this problem. So yes, that's my, my answer to your question. That is really an interesting closing remark here because um, you mentioned the power of the community also when you're running your project uh, to free, uh, through feedback loops and get some advice from, from the community. We have here for the Smart Code Challenge a lot of mentors involved in giving feedback and answering questions uh, to the participants. Also, um, as Adelaide mentioned before, the uh, participants do have another week to really build uh, their proposal and submit uh, their, their ideas. Um, and we are also liberating our calendars in order to give the participants uh, the possibility to pass their ideas through us to, to pitch their, um, to try and rehearse their pitches. So this is exactly what we try to build up uh, here again. And uh, you just mentioned how important it is and that you trust the community in coming up with ideas on solving issues. And I think these are really, really great uh, closing words. Um, from the chat, I see that there are no further questions yet. So I would like then to thank you again very much, Thomas. Um, this uh, presentation will be shared um, online on the collaboration platform that we have. Um, again, thank you very much for your time today. It was really inspirational to us. And um, I wish you a lovely day ahead. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ines. Thank you, Adelaide. And good luck for your for the last uh, the last week of uh, of of uh, preparation for the pitch. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.